My name is Stephanie Einan, and I am the chair of the Gender Responsive Standards Initiative, and I am also the Standards Makers Engagement and Inclusion Manager at the British Standards Institution. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us this morning. I can see we have about uh, 40 people and climbing with us this morning, but I did want to start on time because we have a fantastic and very packed agenda. Um, and um, before we move on to that, I would like to do a little bit of um, housekeeping. I'm sure everyone is familiar now with various different uh, forms of um, on online meeting tools, but just in case, um, hopefully you can see at the bottom of your screens, there's a, a towards the right hand corner, there's a chat button. That's how you can chat. Um, there's also, you should also see three small dots towards the center where the mute and the video buttons are. And in there, you can see there's, hopefully, you can all see there's a raise hand function. Um, so can I, can I ask when it comes to participating in the session with questions or comments you'd like to make, if you could please either raise your hand or pop a note in the chat that you would like the floor um, so that we can come to people in turn, that would be fantastically helpful for us. Um, also, can I please ask that when you're not speaking, please do um, remain on mute to avoid any um, interference or um, uh, uh, background noise. So I, I hope you have all seen the agenda for, for today. Is it possible perhaps to share that on screen um, at the moment, just in case people haven't seen it? Certainly, Tees, just a sec. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, so we'll just be um, sharing that um, on screen at the moment. Um, you can see that we have um, two parts to our event today. In the first part of our event, we're really reflecting again on some of the differential impacts on women caused by the, the pandemic and the role that gender responsive standards can play in um, minimizing these types of impacts for future such events or, or similar events that may, that may um, differentially impact women, particularly in the workplace. We know that many, many women um, effectively had a forced choice of, of leaving the workplace um, this year due to the double burden of, of work and care and, and homeschooling, et cetera, and so on. Um, and as well as many other effects we've talked about here in our sessions about PPE and, and other, um, other concerns that have been raised. So really fantastic to see the speakers we've got with us today who can start to help us to um, further explore some of the some of the particular issues, the specific issues, and hopefully help us move towards um, more gender responsive standards in these areas in the future, um, so that um, we don't see the 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 differential negative impact on women that we've seen over the course of the pandemic. And then in the second part of the agenda, you will see um, we're talking about the work of the initiative, um, and we have. Um, three project teams um, that have been working on three different elements um, who will report back to you on, on the work. And we also will have some reports from national standards bodies um, around the world um, on what they have been doing with regards to their gender action plans and gender responsive standards and standards development. And then finally, um, we'll close with a few very important words from Lance Thompson, who is the acting sec secretary of Working Party 6, of which the Gender Responsive Standards uh, Initiative is a part. Um, so um, hopefully we can all adopt the agenda for today. I don't know if there's a thumbs up function in Web WebEx. 
Um, but perhaps um, if you all accept the agenda, ah, yay, I can see someone found the thumbs up. Great, we've got loads of thumbs up, fabulous. Excellent, so we will adopt the agenda for today and um, Tauna, you can flip the slides back on. Sorry for um, <laughs> the, the changing around. Um, I really, again, I'm very excited about, about today's um, discussion. I'm very much looking forward to it. But the first thing I have to do um, this morning is offer you an apology due to, um, shall we call it, a, a slight scheduling mishap. Um, I, I am apparently only available for the first hour of our session this morning. I have another meeting which I, I could not um, rearrange. Um, and my most sincere apologies for that. Again, I'm not exactly sure how that mishap uh, uh, came to be, but um, Ray Walsh has very, very kindly um, agreed to step in and I will pass the baton to Ray um, after the first hour of the session and he will very ably um, chair um, the second half of the second session, the second hour. So again, my sincere apologies for that. Um, but uh, so without further ado, um, I have, I've introduced, um, the theme of, of the 1st part of our session today. And again, I think, I think this is incredibly important. We are still in a moment where we need to repeatedly demonstrate why gender responsive standards are important. And I think our, our speakers today will help us see in very specific areas where the needs are and why we need to continue to advocate and to push forward on on gender equality in standards and standards development and for gender responsive standards so um, without further ado i would like to introduce our first speaker who is a colleague of mine at bsi sally swingewood who is a lead standards development manager so, um, Sally, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Can we start the slides, please? So, as Stephanie said, I am a lead standards development manager at BSI. I'm responsible for occupational health and safety management and quality management. So, overarching systems that affect everybody. Um, and I am also the committee manager for the ISO Committee on Occupational Health and Safety Management. Next slide, please. So let's start with the big picture. Health and safety management standards are written for everybody. They are suitable for every organization and they are designed to protect everyone. They are written with the intention of inclusivity. Um, Unlike many standards committees, the Occupational Health and Safety Committee has good female representation in its working groups and overall. However, if we can go to the next slide, please. What we're learning is that despite the intention of inclusivity, despite the discussions around inclusivity, when these standards are being applied, they often exclude the, the needs of women. Users don't look beyond their own experience because they just don't see it. They don't have the eyes for it. And if it's not explicit in the standard, it doesn't get done. We do put in examples of things throughout our standards, but they're not definitive lists. Yet people see them as definitive lists. We often start when we're writing standards with lots of detail, lots of examples. And as we go through the process, these get stripped out to make the text shorter, to make it more readable and more accessible. Unfortunately, that means a lot of that explicit detail gets taken away again. Next slide, please. So we have learned through examination and conversations with gender experts that we need to do more. We thought we were covering women's needs and we're not. So these issues of diversity and gender responsiveness are now being actively addressed in the TC. And we are seeking inclusivity champions 
for the chair's advisory group to help um, discuss and raise issues at the highest level, but also in all working groups. So there is somebody in every working group who is actually championing the needs of women and gender issues more widely. We're trying to develop language guidance for our standards writers at the moment and develop training to make sure everybody in the committee is equipped to do this. We have our overarching standard, ISO 45001, which sets out requirements for a management system on occupational health and safety. And we're aware that it is failing to address women's needs. But the implementation guidance standard, ISO 45002, is in its final stages now, and we have the opportunity to address the deficiencies of the management system standard, and we will be seeking to do that through the guidance document. And when we do revise ISO 45001, we will seek to redress the balance. Next slide, please. Uh, and you can go on again. I'd like to talk very briefly about ISO 45005, which is the general guidelines for safe working during the pandemic. As Stephanie said, women have had a bigger impact. And there has been a bigger impact on women than men often in many parts of the world because of the dual responsibilities. Next slide, please. So Pass 45005 is generic again, like all of our standards. It tells you how to adjust where, how, and when you work. It does really stress the importance of worker participation, consultation, listening to people, and addressing psychological health and well-being. And I think these are key for our discussions today. If we can go on, please. So diversity and inclusivity were at the heart of all the discussions in 45005. And there is a specific clause on inclusivity, but it does not express explicitly focus on gender. However, there are multiple mentions of typical gender issues, childcare, caring for sick relatives, for example, or older people, pregnancy. But only one clause in the leadership and worker, um, worker participation clause cites women as a specific group of workers who need specific consideration. Next, please. And going back to psychological health and safety, we have a new standard published in 2021, which again, we believed when we were writing it and before it was published that this really did address gender issues. And yet on examination, it, there isn't as much as we thought there was. It, it sets out in very simple terms for non-experts, non-psychologists, where risks arise from in this area, how work is organised, social factors and the work environment, and gives examples of negative impacts and what you can do. If we can go on, please. And gender is mentioned. So it's recurring consideration is specifically cited as a workplace issue in terms of psychological health and many psychosocial hazards include a gender reference, gender based violence, verbal, physical assault, sexual assault, gender identity, gender harassment, bullying. However, given the complexities around language around gender and the and you know, the emerging conversation, the evolving conversation about gender, we took a very definite active decision not to talk about women, as this was seen as being too exclusive, excluding of other gender identities. Now, how we redress the balance to ensure that the needs of girls and women, biologically born women are addressed, without excluding other gender issues is something that we are still working on. We are having these discussions. We're trying to find the best way to do this, but it is complicated. And I think we need to understand that, that it's not as simple as just talking about remember women's needs. Remember that women may have these needs because there are um, definite issues with calling people women if they present as men for example, or biologically born men who now present as women who will have issues 
just like women do because of the way they present, but won't have the same issues in terms of their physiology or size necessarily. Okay, if we can go on, please. So psychological considerations going forward, we have had a hard time in the pandemic. Um, so we need to all act and we need to think about this in everything we do. Create an environment where speaking up is encouraged and the quietest voices are heard as well as the loudest ones. Be flexible, give workers more autonomy about the way they work, how they work, when they work, where they work. This is really, really important for women who often have dual responsibilities, who are often not meant by society, by their family, their friends, the world they live in, to put work first. And yet employers still see that as the way it should be in too many cases. So we have to develop a working world which takes into account that we are human beings, we have whole lives. And we have to take into account those common responsibilities that largely fall on women. Allow people to continue to work remotely if that's an option or in a hybrid model so that people can manage their lives without undue stress, anxiety, burnout. Women are very, very likely to burn out because they simply have too much on their shoulders many times with childcare and the rest of the responsibilities. We can get all of these. And again. So looking forward, use a standard like ISO 45001 to build an overarching system that manages all types of health and safety risk and build that equitable culture. Make sure that system that you've developed doesn't assume that all needs are the same. Take into account those individual needs and those group needs. For example, of women, there are other groups you need to take into account too. And psychological health, safety and well-being is going to be a really long-term issue. This has to be at the heart of everything you're doing. So please don't neglect it. Please don't think that this is dealt with by teaching people to be individually resilient. This is an organisational issue. How work is organised, the culture of your workplace. These are absolutely huge factors that need addressing long before you come to individual interventions or encouraging people to do more exercise or stop smoking or eat more healthily. Use the lessons learned during the pandemic to enhance people's health and safety and plan, plan ahead. We're not going back to normal and there will be more crises. So be prepared and really learn from the fact that women and girls have been adversely affected in these difficult times where change was very rapid and non-negotiable. So we have to build systems that are fair to 50% of our working population. That's it from me. There are, there's more information in the slides which can be shared, which is more about accessing the standards I've talked about, but that's me for now. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, um, Sally. In, in the interests of the agenda and my timekeeping <laughs> for today, if it's all right with everyone, what I'd like to do is to ask you if you have any specific questions you would like to ask Sally, just please make a note of those and we'll come back to those during the Q&A when we'll be able to ask questions of, of all of our um, speakers um, here this morning in this first half of the program. So that being said, it gives me great pleasure, pleasure excuse me, to be able to introduce to you Louise Hosking, president of the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. So, um, Louise is here this morning, as you can see, talking to us about diversity in the world of occupational safety and health, which I think will dovetail nicely with with Sarah's Louise, lovely to have you with us this morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And um, yeah, uh, my speech, I think, will definitely dovetail straight into Sally. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for that. My name is Louise Hosking. I'm president of IOSH, which stands for the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. 
and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, just a little bit about IOSH. Um, we're the chartered global body and the world's largest membership organisation for health and safety professionals, with almost 48,000 members in around 130 countries, um, working in nearly every sector. And our vision is to achieve a safer, safer, healthier world of work for everyone. This year, we were also delighted to receive the designation of an accredited Commonwealth organisation, which means we are directly recognised across 54 governments over six continents. I'm honoured to be here today and thank you for organising and inviting us to be involved in this very important discussion. I'd like to take this opportunity to consider where the world is now following what is a seismic change and disruption caused by the pandemic and the very many strengths in diversity that offer answers to the challenges that face our work working world. As we've already heard, we know that the pandemic has disproportionately burdened women. Globally, gender equality is one of the UN's life-enhancing sustainability goals, seen as a fundamental human right and a foundation for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. Greater diversity, equality and representation in workplaces worldwide is not just the morally right thing to do, it makes smart business sense as these organisations are much more socially sustainable, balancing their ethical, financial, societal and environmental values. This very much speaks to the heart of our current Catch the Wave campaign and recent white paper on harnessing the power of social sustainability, which can be found and freely um, downloaded from our website. If we are to solve the most complex issues we are facing at this current time, we need everyone to bring their best selves forward. So I was elected Vice President of IOSH in 2017 and President elect in 2020. I became President just last week and only the fifth female President in our 76 year history. We need role models in leadership positions to help to prioritise positive actions to repair our leaking pipelines for all underrepresented groups from our future leader, leaders' communities, which are much more diverse. Challenges faced by women to succeed are real. I've always had to work harder and be better than my next best male colleague. I'm continuously navigating the likability factor and self-doubt which holds those with more traditional feminine traits back. I meet so many women wrestling with perfectionism because when they make a mistake, a spotlight is held over them in a manner many male colleagues do not experience. Many women also struggle with guilt as they navigate caring responsibilities. The workplace is not a meritocracy this wears us down, it damages relationships, causes stress and contributes to poor mental health. It also deprives our organisations of the best performing mix of talent and effort. It makes absolutely no business sense. A recent survey of IOSH members showed that only 21% are female. This figure has barely changed since I joined 22 years ago. And we know that women are represented disproportionately at our lower membership grades. Now, translate this into the work that we do. An ERM survey showed women account for only 15% of the most senior health and safety roles in our largest organisations, but despite 29% being the norm for other similar roles. In organisations which are predominantly also male, such as construction or offshore, this means health and safety issues are only being seen through a very narrow lens. It means basic conditions and rights for women may not be considered. As an example, safe exposure levels for hazardous substances have been determined by male test subjects because they do not have a menstrual cycle and hormone variability is known to affect results. Women have proportionately more body fat 
and some substances are much more fat soluble. So this means they could be at greater risk. As we've heard, personal protective equipment has been a long-standing issue and is continually discussed in health and safety circles. By this, I mean the availability of smaller size safety footwear and contoured protective clothing, which fits, is comfortable and is therefore used correctly. It is available, but some organisations are still opting for a one size fits all approach to their PPE and uniform. And actually, this is equally an issue for men because they too come in all different shapes and sizes. The health and safety profession has and is changing, particularly as a result of the pandemic. There is an increasing focus on the health of our nations and a more balanced workforce and a modern workforce is expecting much greater work life balance. In occupational safety and health, we, need, we do need to make some fixed decisions about what we do. For example, when an alarm sounds, our colleagues must react correctly. But in the fast changing, unpredictable, globally connected world we now live in, risk based choices are being made by us all rapidly every day. These should be much more flexible and dynamic. There are always a variety of ways to solve a problem. Our profession is adapting to this by working collaboratively with other professional bodies and other parts of our businesses. Our clipboards have long been discarded in favour of empathy, curiosity, compassion and servant leadership. These are skills which are traditionally much more feminine. The reality is we need a variety of different approaches in our workplaces. So when we raise up women, we raise everyone. This is an organisational issue, it's not just a women's issue. The adjustments we can make in the workplace, such as flexible working, better caregivers leave and resolving the gender pay gap are good for our male colleagues too. In business, we know better decisions are made when different perspectives are challenged and debated, when all voices are heard. In health and safety, different perspectives achieve smarter choices. And in our profession, this means we save more lives. So in conclusion, we need our people to bring their best selves to the workplace. The challenges we currently face to protect the health of our planet and our populations have been created by people, but it's our people who also solve, could also find the solutions. Our members around the world have proven how vital they have been. If this time has taught us anything, it is just how connected and interdependent we all are. Future generations are going to look back in history at what we all do right now, and we will be judged as much for the actions we don't take as for the actions we take. So let's embrace diversity, ensure equality, promote competency, and make our successes proud. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Louise. That really did fit in incredibly nicely with um, Sally's, Sally's remarks. So um, we really appreciate that. Again, um, we will have questions for all of our speakers during the Q&A segment. So now I'd like to move on. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be able to introduce our third speaker, Lorelai Carabolante, who was is the project leader of the ISO Technical Committee uh, TC260's Working Group 8 on Diversity and Inclusion, who were responsible for uh, the development of a new ISO uh, standard, ISO 30415 on Diversity and Inclusion in the Workplace. Lorelai, uh, a warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share out my screen here. Make sure that it's going to share correctly. Let's see here. Why is this? Um, While you're sharing the screen, I can also just remind everyone to please feel free to say hello in the chat. We've had lots of people um, letting us know where they're from, where they're joining us from this morning. We have colleagues from ARSO from the Rwanda Standards Board, from Mauritius, from DG Grow, 
Portuguese standardization body, uh, of the uh, Institute for Is Islamic Countries. So please do um, say hello in the chat. It helps our speakers too to see who's here. So, Lorelai, are I you am, able to share? Yeah, I should be able to uh, to share. I'm just playing around with which screen is which. It looks like um, this screen is the is the one that I want to share. So, if I share this screen, are you seeing uh, the presentation there? Yeah, looks like you are. Yes, we've got it now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, indeed. Well, thank you for your interest in learning about ISO 30415, 2021, Human Resource Management, Diversity and Inclusion. ISO 30415 was also written for everyone, prioritizing inclusivity, which included many female ISO registered experts involved throughout the process. In today's increasingly interconnected world, recognizing and leveraging diversity and inclusion can be critical for organizations seeking to increase innovation and enhance their resilience, sustainability, and reputation by creating a culture that releases everyone's talents, gifts, and expertise. Numerous studies have shown that workplace diversity and inclusion can also foster innovation and lead to new markets and financial benefits. There is also corresponding evidence that when employees feel heard, they are far more likely to be motivated to do their best work in conditions that enable effective collaboration and participation. Developing an inclusive organizational culture requires consistent commitment from all areas of the organization, particularly at the top. An inclusive culture not only brings many benefits, but it also touches on some fundamental human rights. Recognizing the immense importance of this, ISO recently published this new standard to guide organizations every step of the way. Although the work began early in 2016, our team of ISO registered experts from 14 different countries worked through numerous ISO document draft stages through the end of 2020, which is when the final draft was voted on leading to its May 4th publication. A central strength of ISO international standards is that they are developed by consensus across multiple stakeholders. The document was revised multiple times over the five year period through ISO commenting disposition, and this actually included responding to more than 2,000 comments from the participating countries, which ultimately voted to publish it as a new international standard. And to give you an idea, that was 33 participating countries. This international standard genuinely represents the perspectives of stakeholders from many countries and cultures, multiple diversities and diversity dimensions, and all working together for about five years to create this consensus-based international standard. This figure may seem complex, our figure one in the standard, but I'll go through it in its elements one at a time so you'll be able to follow the concepts behind it. ISO HR management standards follow the plan, do, check, review approach to implementing their recommendations. So specifically, what you should do what you should measure, what are some of the expected outcomes, and what impacts do those actually have on the organization? We recognize that some fundamental prerequisites are needed for organizations of any size or growth base to implement the recommendations in ISO 30415 and to demonstrate their commitment to DNI while developing an inclusive organization at the same time. 
which recognizes the need for alignment with the organization's vision, mission, values, objectives, and systems. This includes workforce health, safety, and well being. Recognizing diversity, valuing all people and acknowledging that demographics and other personal characteristics can possibly be protected by law and regulation. Governing effectively, exemplifying and promoting leadership commitment to DNI. Acting accountably, acting in an ethical and socially responsible manner, promoting productive employment and decent work for all. Working inclusively, enabling and developing an accessible and respectful workplace environment. Communicating inclusively, recognizing and responding to the needs of people who access, understand, and relate to communication in different ways. Advocating and championing DNI. Actively influencing and promoting inclusive organizational practices and stakeholder relationships. The DNI prerequisites that I just reviewed can function as a kind of metaphorical bridge across the organization's DNI framework. Well, it can also incorporate and articulate the organization's DNI principles and objectives accountabilities and responsibilities, DNI actions related to, for example, the HR management life cycle, even the supply chain, products and services and relationships with external stakeholders. Using a framework structure supported by the DNI prerequisites can be an effective way to leverage the DNI benefits and demonstrate organizational social, re social responsibility at the same time. However, designating a leader with accountability for ensuring the maintenance, continual improvement, and relevance of the DNI framework is essential to promoting and fostering an inclusive organizational culture on an ongoing basis. Organizational sustainability, as mentioned earlier, recognizes and leverages that DNI can be critical for organizations seeking to increase innovation, enhance their resilience, sustainability, and reputation as well. ISO 30415 promotes the economic growth by setting a common language and internationally agreed to specifications and then links to these DNI sustainable development goals, especially goal five gender equity, goal eight, decent work and economic growth, goal nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure, and goal 10, reduced inequity, inequality, reduced inequality, excuse me. I know that. <laughs> Accountabilities and responsibilities is another area. It's a big clause in the standard. And uh, they're outlined in a way that addresses governance, leadership, delegation and alignment of DNI principles with the strategic objectives of the organization, such that they are integrated into, and this is very critical, the organization's policies, processes, and practices and systems that include HR management, products and services, supply chain, and external stakeholder relationships as well. So the governance, leadership, designated responsibilities for DNI, for example, and then integrated into those DNI principles and strategic objectives. Each of these clauses addressed in the document follows actions, measures, and outcome in a, in a kind of structure to make it easy to implement. And the methodology to identify what is done and the impact to the organization so that change and continual improvement can be enabled, for example. Here is an example of an inclusive culture action correlated by a measure and an outcome. Throughout the standard, the structure correlates actions, measures, and outcomes, potential outcomes, 
And that way you can look to see how it impacts your organization. So here's one. Organizations should collect data by diversity dimension on workforce health, safety, and well-being, including absence, workforce turnover, and retention to identify trends and adverse impacts action. So the measure for that can be material to the organization analyzed by aggregate and segmented diversity dimension, uh, including data on workforce health, safety, and well-being, including absence, workforce turnover, and retention to identify trends and adverse impacts. An example of the related outcome could be a safer work environment is realized and incidents of complaints, grievances, and risks are identified and addressed. The human resource management life cycle describes the main stages of an individual's engagement in the organization. And this includes examples of the impact of DNI integration in human resource processes and practices across the life cycle, including workforce planning, remuneration, recruitment, onboarding, learning and development, performance management, succession planning, workforce mobility, and finally cessation of employment. Through effective HR management and leveraging diverse perspectives, products, and services, the organization can be more inclusive, and foster innovation by meeting the needs of a broader base of customers, clients, and users, which also supports the SDG Goal 9, Industry, Innovation, and Infrastructure. Procurement and supply chain partner relationships can demonstrate a continual commitment to DNI in their effective HR management practices to ensure the provision of decent work, safe and secure working conditions and fair and respectful treatment of people, which relates to SDG goal number eight, decent work and economic growth. It's important for organizations to recognize the needs, expectations, and interests of external stakeholders too, as they can impact DNI outcomes positively or negatively. An organization's reputation is crucial. For example, it sends a signal into its ecosystem across external stakeholders. Ultimately, the DNI principles that the organization develops and adopts needs to be incorporated into its systems, its policies, processes, and practices, including health and safety, making them real in the organization and not just a binder or book on the shelf. I hope this quick review is helpful to give you an introduction to <clears throat> ISO 30415 in its framework. Diversity and inclusion details what is required to create a diverse and inclusive organizational culture and leverage the benefits that this brings. That's the goal of the standard. It encourages organizations to use a continual improvement approach, including plan, do, check, and review. It is intended to help organizations achieve DNI objectives and to evaluate their outcomes and impacts on people, communities, and society, as well as to meet the sustainable development goals. To facilitate the use of this document by organizations, our working group also created a checklist of DNI actions included in the annex. It's a voluntary guidance standard. But that checklist is designed to be a tool that organizations can use to access and confirm if and how they're meeting ISO 30415 in evidence based ways. Special thanks to, I'd like to call out ISO Technical Committee TC260 HR management members from all over the world who contributed to the development of this new international standard for the benefit of organizations and all their stakeholders. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at the email in uh, the information there. Thank you very much, um, Lorelai. I'm going to go straight introduce to introducing our next speaker. Um, I think these presentations are really working well.
help together and give us plenty of uh, food for thought. But without further ado, I want to make sure we have some time for questions and answers with our speakers. So I'd like to introduce uh, Carla Samuels, who is the standardization uh, project manager at Inteco, which is um, a technical uh, standards institute in Costa Rica. Carla, very welcome to you this morning. The floor is yours. You're on mute, it seems. Can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here today and present you our standard. Okay. First of all, uh, so my name is Carla Samuels. I, I lead the technical committee for gender equality in Inteco, Costa Rica. So you could go next, please. Okay, I want to show you some numbers of gender inequality so we can see the big picture that we have here in Costa Rica in matter of gender. Okay, for example, the labor force participation rate on females is 49% and on males is 72%. Also, we have the unemployment rate that for females is 25% and for males is 18%. Also, we have this very important indicator that is the time use on, on paid care and, the, and domestic work. For example, women, generally women uses 35 hours weekly just on on paid care and domestic works and you could see also that males only spend 13 hours weekly on the same on the same duties also on decision making positions only three of ten directors or managers in the private sector are women and also the wage gap is actually 8% difference between women and men. Next, please. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our standard, okay? Our national standard toward the, toward the gender equality from we did have on 2015 we had our, our standard and we seems with the implementation of the standards we find out that there are many lessons learned during this process so one of those that one of those um, lessons learned is that the organizations are interested and willing to work on gender equality issues also, we saw the importance of the public and private partnerships. Also, we saw the, the need of providing partial certification or at least the recognition of good practices as a way to maintain the interest and encourage them to continue with the process of the certification. Next, please. Okay, so the our standard uh, is the INTE G38. We published it this year. Is the version 2021. This is the last version, and we we develop it jointly with the National Institute of Women. Okay, we have three. We have many improvements. One of those is that we have three different schemes of certification depending on the needs of each organization. So we have three levels of certification. The, the basic one or the first one is the promotion for gender equality in the workplace. The second one is affirmative actions for gender, gender equality in the workplace. And the third one is the management system for gender equality in the workplace. Also, 
includes a chapter for public institutions and we have the new topics, for example, sexual harassment, communication, health and safety and security. Next, please. So this is the this this is this these are the steps how we could we could get the certification, how the organizations can get the certification. First of all, it starts with the with the management commitment. Okay. The second step is the gender gap analysis data. The third step is the development of the gender equality policy and the action plan. Also, the fourth step will be the implementation of the action plan that you have to take in account the HR, the health, the promotion of shared responsibility within the household and the workplace environment. And the last step is the external audit and certification process. Well, basically, uh, this is my presentation for today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Carla. That was um, really very interesting and, and great to see that progress um, taking place in, in Costa Rica under your, your leadership. So now um, I will uh, open up to questions from the floor. I can see one um, for all of our panelists. Perhaps all of our panelists can turn your cameras on and your microphones on so that um, we can come to you in turn. I see one question um, in the chat um, about encouraging or favoring recruiting more women. Um, would that be considered as creating equal opportunity? Um, how are we impartial um, or, or does that mean we're not impartial? And how do we, how could we address any challenges if raised during an audit to, um, favoring or recruiting more women does anyone want from the panel want to address that question um i i don't mind starting stephanie um thank you louise it, you know this is a really challenging um area around um you know how, how do we how do we solve this problem of of, of having more women coming through um, and by having quotas um, that can create a whole load of additional challenges as well. Um, one of the pieces that I've been working um, through um, as president of IOSH is um, by encouraging women and underrepresented groups or people with more feminine traits um, to to look at programs for pipelines um, that gives them the confidence to step forward and step out um, around mentoring programs, sponsorship, those kind of things. Because what I'm seeing from certainly from my position is that women um, and those with more feminine traits, um, or you know, they're they're less extrovert. Um, may be very capable of, of fulfilling much greater ambitions for themselves, but they 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 don't have they're kind of holding themselves back. So a lot of the programs that I'm involved in at the moment are about supporting that pipeline and stopping the pipeline from leaking, as I said in my presentation. Um, and and also um looking for supporting those women that are coming through into leadership positions because I think that when we're there that certainly helps and supports as well. Um, so I think there's always a combination of things, but um, quotas and, and um, you know, it always starts to raise an interesting discussion that can be quite challenging. So I think it's probably a combination of factors. Thanks, Louise. Does anyone else on the panel want to address how we um, bring more women into the workplace um, fairly and um, equitably. We'd be happy to add. Lorelai, please do go ahead. Well, during our uh, development of ISO 30415, this particular conversation did come up 
uh, as you noticed in the HR management life cycle, we have both a, um, an area of recruitment and uh, onboarding, which are, are crucial. I, um, I really appreciated uh, Louise's comment about filling the, type line, the pipeline and actually uh, recognizing the importance of including everyone. And I think it's a matter of, uh, in, in our standard, a matter of being systematic about being inclusive and, and welcoming and really focusing on, uh, on, that, on that recruitment area of all genders and, uh, and, and women included very definitely. So I think that if that's overall, prior, if that's prioritized overall, uh, that it would, uh, it would pass uh, an audit because you would be able to show that your priority is inclusivity, much in the same way that Sally referenced. Um, it, the standard is prioritizing the inclusion of everyone. Great, thank you. I see we've had another question um, pop up. So, um, uh, Carla, th there's a question for you. Um, it, it, one of our um, participants would like a little bit more clarification on the process for certification and some examples of companies which have already been certified. Carla, are you still there? Uh oh, I think we may have lost Carla. We'll we'll come back to that in a moment. I I I can't see Carla myself here, still on the call. Um, apologies about that. We can certainly. Um, send that question along. And then there's another question. Let me just find it. Um, so a question um, about what what have been the biggest challenges within your own organizations or the, the, the processes you were responsible for in terms of um, bringing gender, the need for, for gender equality, gender responsiveness in standards um, to the fore and getting support for pursuing that as an objective. Um, Sally, you alluded to this a little bit in your presentation. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about, you sort of portrayed it as a, as a gap. It's just not, doesn't come to mind. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? And then I'll ask our other panelists um, if they would like to come in on this one. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, there's a few challenges, to be quite honest. One of the first ones is that the experts writing the standards believe they are being inclusive already. Um, that everything that is being written is meant to apply to everybody, and it repeatedly says that. Um, the, the problem there is the gap between the intention and what is actually done when the standards are implemented. So that's the first thing. But the second and probably bigger thing is that people don't understand what happens to women. What are the issues? Why is it important? They simply don't have the knowledge. Now, as women, um, we have personal experience, but even women in these roles who are implementing these standards still go for this generic implementation because that is the society they're working in it is the society they're used to it is the way their organizations are run so we have a lot of issues around that and we also have issues with some countries and some particular individuals who are involved in standards development thinking this is just a politically correct move that you know if we start writing specific references to women and girls, then we're going to have to go down a rabbit hole of every single type of group. They're not kind of grasping that this is 50% of our population in the world are born female. So it's not a minority group, not that the minority groups need, shouldn't be addressed, but it's, it's a real understanding issue here. We need more data. We need more gender expertise coming to talk to our committees so they really get it, so they really understand it. It can't just be me saying it. It needs somebody with some authority in this space. Yes, that, that received a clap from one of our <laughs> several claps. Yes, 
Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that's come come up repeatedly. So um, we are slightly over time. Um, I apologize. I've, I've already stolen five minutes, the rest of the program. And um, my other meeting has just started. So I am going to uh, very um, uh, hastily pass the, the chairing baton to Ray um, with my final word of thanks to all of you as participants and to our speakers so far this morning. Um, I think you're going to have a great discussion about um, the work of, of the um, Gender Responsive Standards Initiative. Um, and I hope you will all stay for that and get engaged with that discussion as well. So thank you very much, Ray. I am passing you the baton and I am exiting the room. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks very much for that. And thanks to all our speakers uh, in this morning, the session. So thanks to Sally, to Louise, to Lorelai and to Carla. Um, my name is Ray Walsh and I am uh, part of the, the team, uh, the project teams that are, are looking after uh, various aspects of the GSI uh, project work that's taking taking place um, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, my back, <coughs> excuse me, my background is in standards. Uh, I, I work for the European Commission and for the Adapt Research Centre in relation to standards uh, in AI and most of, of the emerging technology areas and have a keen interest obviously in, in relation to gender responsive standards particularly and try to promote them as, as best we can uh, when and where we get the opportunity to, to do that. Um, so for my part of the session this, more, uh, this afternoon or this morning, well, sorry, uh, the various time zones involved here is to uh, introduce some of my colleagues, uh, Lucy He, Michelle Barcuda, and, and also myself to, to present um, some of the updates uh, from uh, the, the project teams. And the project teams are covering three specific areas. One is training and best practice, uh, and it's in the leads for for that group is Lucy He and um, Peter Murphy. Uh, gender responsive standards and methodology is Michelle Barguda and for myself then for the project team three on network development. Um, so without any further uh, ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Lucy and Lucy will do a quick update on uh, our team. Lucy. Thank you, Ray. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy and uh, I'm from Project Team One. Thank you for having me here today and allowing me. To... Sorry, Lucy, we just step back on these slides because Lucy's doing a verbal update. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, Lucy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me here today and uh, allowing me to provide an update for our project team. So, for Project Team One, we have completed the draft of a survey questions to obtain information regarding tools and resources, including gender action plans, training materials, and the research studies. So we have submitted the completed draft to WP6 for a review in earlier of this month. The finalized uh, survey will be transferred into SurveyMonkey after the review from WP6 and uh, distributed by WP6. Uh, the survey is expected to, to be ready for distribution in the first quarter of 2022, which is next year. We expect to begin consolidation of the information ready for consultation with the other two working uh, project teams in mid of next year. And much appreciate again here for to everyone who has been contributing to this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of work has been going on within the, the project teams and uh, team one and that work is ongoing. So if you uh, want to contribute to you can contact Lucy and to get involved with the training and best practice uh, work that's that's going on. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle, Michelle Barcuda. Mich Michelle is working on Project Team 2 and Gender Responsive Standards, and Je Michelle will be doing a, a verbal update on the work of PT2. Uh, over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Ray. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and share a little bit about what we've been doing on Project Team 2. 
So I'll give you an update on where we're at at this moment, the a bit of a preview of the guidelines that we're developing. And then finally, I'll talk to you a little bit about the next steps. So we are developing guidelines on how to develop gender responsive standards. We have had a very engaged project team, and I'm happy to report that we have a draft of the guidelines available now. Well, not available for everyone, but available within the team. So what we've done is we've had two rounds of review. The project team members are currently satisfied with the content. And so in terms of the content, we spent quite a bit of time when we were developing these guidelines, thinking about who the audience would be. And we've decided that this is meant to be for technical committee members. The reason for that, obviously, is that this will hopefully give it the broadest usage. So we know that it's still meant to be helpful for, for national standards bodies and for those in leadership positions, but really we want to provide practical advice for those who will be on the committees to try to help them ensure that standards are gender responsive. So we've tried to keep the document brief and hopefully make it something that's concise that will be easily usable. In terms of the content, we give an overview of what we mean by gender responsive standards and why they're important. And then we focus on two areas. So first, increasing participation of women in technical committees. And then two, ensuring that standards are gender responsive, independent of who is developing those standards. As I said, the guidelines are meant to be practical and actionable. So we give advice on how you can increase representation how we can make sure that as, and I think Luis, that when people are there, that they actually do participate regardless, and we don't just hear the loudest voices. The guidelines also talk about the importance of sex or segregated data to inform standards development and the options when that data is not available. As for the next steps, the, the guidelines are currently with the chair of the GRSI and the chair of the other project teams for review. And so once they are satisfied, we'll make a final round of revisions there. The guidelines will then go to the chair and vice chair of working party six for their approval. Once they have approved it, the guidelines can be shared in an advanced copy can be shared online. The guidelines will then we will seek approval at the next working party meeting. So next November, and then the guidelines will be published in 2023. Thank you. If I've missed something, I'm assuming that Lance or Ocean will correct me in terms of the next steps, but I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michelle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of work has, has been carried out by the, the project teams in, uh, over the last uh, 12 months, and we're getting to a stage now where we're um, put through Michelle's work and through Lucy's work, we're going to have some documents that could be coming to you soon after been after been approved um, uh, at the next plenary meeting, obviously. Um, so next on the agenda is myself. So I'm going to introduce myself again, uh, and this time it's, it's to talk about the project team three, which is now development and uh, next slide please so just giving a quick update so part of what we're trying to do um with within the the project teams is not just to set the scene for uh, what is gender responsiveness but also to to create an awareness of it and to uh, grow the ecosystem of sort of gender responsive champions and and, and evangelists uh, that will try and make the message get the message out there but also to to get involved in with, with projects that have an active contribution um so so looking at gender action plans etc so that work will be going on in in uh, into 2022 um and uh, I think you'll see you'll see a lot more happening uh, with once it becomes available to uh, publicly outside of the the project teams. Uh, just to highlight some of the initiatives that I was involved in myself in in, in terms of trying to raise the awareness uh, in relation to uh, gender and gender responsive standards. Uh, included the participation in the Sen -Sen like inclusive, inclusive European standardization case for gender in March um, the OECD trade and gender event on, on, on uh, Wednesday, the 9th of June. Uh, Women in Science and Gender Equity by the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, uh, so the SDSN, uh, in August. And then the big thing that we were involved in this year uh, from a network development point of view, and this was in partnership with, with Tauno and, and, and Oshin, was to uh, to run a session in the International Conference on Sustainable Development uh, on Gender Equality and, and Gender Responsive Standards. Um, uh, in partnership with uh, Elizabeth uh, Pulitzer, um, who, who chaired session 2A and I chaired session 10A on, on over two days uh, in September uh, at the ICSD. We had 12 accepted presentations uh, from, from Africa and the Middle East and from Europe and from America, um, right across the gamut on, on gender uh, related issues um, uh, presented by experts in the, in the field. And the next stage 
that we will be getting involved in um, is to pr prepare three uh, journal articles based on the, the best three uh, presentations, uh, gender presentations at the workshop. Um, and that will will go to an inter international journal for, for publication. So they're, they're being reviewed at the moment. Uh, Elizabeth has completed her review and I'm partially through my review as well. And hopefully that by the end of this week, uh, we will be finished the review process and some of those um, publications will be, uh, some of those articles rather will be going for publication and we'll be able to uh, make that information uh, publicly available. So that's uh, that's a, a, an update basically on on the working uh, uh, sorry project team three, um, and to tie the three things together, we're 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 trying to raise not just the the issue of of, of gender equality and gender responsive standards um, uh, on a national level, but we're also trying to an international level, but also trying to go to, to the next mile. Um, so a further further continuation of the declaration. So. A lot of people all over the world, national bodies have signed up to the declaration. And the next step is, is to, I suppose, put meat on the bones and to create gender action plans, which have tangible outputs in terms of the project. So to engage in projects which hire more women, promote more women, um, have to have gender responsiveness in relation to standardization um, portfolio front and center. So not rather just having a, being a signatory to a document, but creating new projects, and those new projects will be um, uh, cont continuing on the work uh, to contribute to the to Sustainable Development Goal Five and gender responsive standards. Okay, so that's that's uh, thanks very much uh, to Lucy and to Michelle uh, and to the the, the work uh, of the project teams and all the members of the project teams who've contributed to that work um, over the last uh, twelve months. And now we're getting back, getting a little bit back on on track. Uh, it's a, we were a little bit behind schedule, but now I want to introduce a, a verbal update um, from Sarah Gobby. And Sarah, Sarah is the director of EU Affairs at ASTM, and um, she's going to give gives a quick update uh, from ASTM. Sarah, over to you, please. Is Sarah there? Yes, I am. Hello. Go ahead, uh, Sarah. If you can uh, hear or see me, hopefully, yes. I can hear you perfectly, Sarah. Uh, your okay. camera is not on, though. Okay, uh, just a sec. Okay, should be now. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I will just provide a very brief update uh, on AECM International's recent activities on uh, um, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as um, gender responsive uh, standardization. So, as you know, uh, ASTM is a part is a signatory of the uh, gender responsive uh, standards declaration of the UNECE, and we are also part of the gender standard responsive. Uh, initiative, our vice president for technical committee operation is participating in, in the working group uh, developing guidelines for um, gender responsive standards that were just uh, were just mentioned. And um, ASTM uh, um, is, um, is committed uh, to gender responsiveness of standardization. And uh, both uh, uh, in increasing representation of women in, in, in our management, in technical committees, and ensure that meetings are inclusive, as well as uh, in ensuring that standards are, are, are gender responsive. And um, so some of the recent activities uh, that, uh, um, that have seen us uh, busy in this, in this space, uh, I will mention some. Um, so we are uh, overseeing uh, two APEC events. One is related to additive manufacturing for protective equipment, and one is related to unmanned aircraft systems or drones. Um, and we made a committed effort to identify uh, women to present, and uh, we uh, accomplished the so to, uh, for, for the first project on additive manufacturing used for PPE, 
uh, we um, we got four uh, four women speaking uh, um, out of a total of ten, and for the other project on drones technologies, total women uh, total number of presenters fourteen, and total number of women presenting six. Um, um, it may seem something uh, not that relevant, but indeed uh, I can tell you that having participated uh, personally in many events related to technology and, and, and scientific matter, uh, it, it's quite um, special to have um, a high number of, of women uh, among the presenters. So we're quite proud of that. Um, and then in terms of participation of women within our organizations, so in 2020, ASTM elected five women to serve on our board of directors. Um, and we are finding new ways to attract diverse voices to our technical committees and uh, to our staff. And uh, also on specific uh, specific activities in, 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 uh, within our portfolio, uh, I mentioned additive manufacturing, and indeed we are supporting um, a group called Women in 3D Printing. Uh, we are supporting its mission, its programs. Uh, last year we sponsored uh, one of, uh, of their conferences um, that was the only conference uh, focused on elevating women um, speakers in this field and we will continue to support their events um, to make sure that women as a strong have a strong voice in in additive manufacturing industry um, also our technical committee uh, f23 uh, on personal protective equipment is also considering fit for PPE, and um, we are part of a joint uh, IFC and Women in Global Health program uh, that is addressing precisely that issue. And I think it was yesterday um, we participated in a in a webinar called Women in Health and PPE. Does one size fit all? This was the ninth event in our learning series under this IFC Women's Leadership in Private Healthcare Working Group. And um, it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, I will learn more and I will, from my colleagues, and I will be happy to, to share uh, with this group uh, if there is any follow-up or outcome uh, that is relevant. Um, so I think, this is it. I just wanted to share some of the most recent activities um, and I'm happy to reply to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Yes, we'll, we'll hold off on questions until after the, the three updates in, in this particular um, uh, section on national standards bodies. Um, and uh, thanks very much for that, for that Sarah. It's, 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 great to, it's great to see people who are actively engaging in in redressing the balance uh, when it comes to particular for technical conferences to to, to have more female members uh, presenting and and speaking at conferences um we, i'm involved in in, in a project with, with stand ict where uh, with Silvana Masella from trust it services in italy and Silvana is always making sure that because it's not it's not that we don't have that expertise we have plenty of people experts you know female experts we just tend not to promote them uh, or the mindset has to be changed i think to to uh, to uh, to um uh have them to the to the four and at these at these events like you know because they're um uh, it, some, sometimes just the tools are not there or the, the, the facilities are, are not there uh, in terms of the internal companies around around the, the conferences to to make sure that gender quality is is, is a f um, front and center. Thanks very much, Sarah. Next is the uh, update from the Spanish Association for Standardization, and it's Natalie Ortiz de Zarata. Over to you, Natalie. So, thank you very much. Thank you to Nete for uh, giving us the opportunity to share our modest, modest I would say, experience here. And uh, next, please. Um, this overview consists of, of uh, several steps as a general overview of what we have done in terms of gender over 2021. The most important uh, step, the cornerstone, I would say, is having had this year 
my general director, Javier Garcia, uh, being nominated ISO gender champion for the Europe region and uh, Central Asia uh, for 2021 and 2022. Up to now, UNE uh, has been participating at uh, UNEFE uh, Gender Responsive uh, Standards Initiative, at ISO Gender uh, Focal Point Network, and also in the 10th and Elec Informal Coordination Group on Gender and Diversity. But the role of uh, the Director General uh, as um, ambassador has been the turning point in our way of addressing the gender topic, uh, pushing us uh, from a position of being a mere spectator to a more active role. And um, this uh, ISO gender uh, champion role indeed is a great responsibility that involves not only my director, but all the team at UNE, because um, somehow we have the commitment uh, to lead by example. And at the same time, I find this uh, to be also uh, an open door to address things and topics that we at UNE have never dared to tackle before. Indeed, for example, we have a great expertise in terms of accessibility with more than 40 national standards, but surprisingly nothing in terms of gender. And somehow this international role has put gender in our national agenda too. Next one, please. So, uh, the main activities of uh, Javier Garcia as gender champion are raising awareness uh, of the ISO Gender Action Plan, uh, promoting the active uh, participation of ISO members in the ISO Gender Focal Point Network. Uh, in fact, this, uh, they will have their next meeting on 14 December. Uh, also, sharing experiences among members in support of a gender inclusive culture within the national standards bodies. And this means the collection of examples, case studies, uh, gender action plans or data or any other initiatives. And also identify and share the needs of ISO members in the region to advance uh, also the next uh, gender action plan, plan 2022-2025. And so with that aim, raise awareness, share experiences and hear the needs of the members in collaboration with ISO, we are organizing a gender webinar on 9th December, where, where of course you are all invited to participate. Next one, please. Uh, also, um, I wanted to say that there are uh, more than uh, 500 million Spanish speakers in the world and in countries where we are used to apply the standards in our own language, the world of getting consensus does not end with the publication of the European or international standard, but with the translation of the standard. As you uh, might remember, the International Workshop Agreement uh, 34, Women's Entrepreneurship, Key Definitions and General Criteria, was published in March this year. And specific, uh, especially in a terminology standard, and, uh, as this one, uh, it is of paramount importance that this effort in the terms and definition is not uh, thrown away by having a dozen different translations into Spanish. So, with the aim of harmonizing the translations in the Spanish language, ISO set up the Spanish Management Translation Group, STMG, with the participation of 17 speaking uh, Spanish countries and COPANT. And the aim of this group is to provide only one version in Spanish available for all Spanish speaking countries based on consensus, ensure technical and linguistic harmonization of terms, facilitating the application of the standard and reducing all, of course, translation time and cost, providing a fast publication and contributing to easier, easier and faster uh, adoption. And what UNE has to do with all that? Well, uh, from UNE, we lead this uh, STMG group for the translation, and specifically in terms of uh, gender, we promoted um, the inclusion of this International Workshop Agreement 34 in the work program of uh, the STMG. We provided this initial translation in, in Spanish, and also we foster and lead a new task force uh, to get consensus uh, around uh, different meetings. So this ended up with the publication of the official version of this uh, I, IWA uh, 34 in Spanish uh, in July 2021. And this means one same version in all 17 Spanish speaking countries that would surely boost the adoption and implementation of this woman entrepreneurship key definitions and general criteria. Next one, please. 
So as a result of this work of harmonization, we have published in our national catalog in UNE, uh, the UNE Workshop Agreement 34 in Spanish in October 2021. And for us, uh, to be honest, this is the first standard uh, addressing directly gender issues. Just as in ISO, we have uh, conducted an internal mapping exercise uh, with our national standards and the SDGs. And from this exercise, we can now say that 4,000 standards contribute to the 17 uh, SDGs. And we can I identify now which standards from our catalog can contribute specifically directly or indirectly to uh, SDG 5. Uh, so how many? Well, um, just a dozen, I'm afraid, uh, and most of them indirectly. So this UNE uh, International Workshop Agreement 34 is the first uh, standard of our catalog addressing uh, uh, gender. Next, uh, please. Um, and there was some Spanish participation in the development of this uh, workshop agreement uh, 34 on women entrepreneurship. We had some universities, some consultancy, but also we had the Ministry of Equality and we wanted to create a more stable relationship with our relevant stakeholders, including the industry. And uh, on the other side, we at UNE uh, voted in favor of the new project committee on guidelines for the promotion and implementation of gender equality proposed by AFNOR. We are now P members, participating members in this ISO project committee, but we need a platform to collect the views of our national stakeholders and hence the need to set up this national mirror committee. Well, we are in the process now. We are contacting key stakeholders and plan to have our national kickoff in January before uh, the international meeting of this new PC. Uh, next one. And now internally behind the doors, uh, well, from UNE, we of course have signed the UNESCO Declaration on Gender Responsive Standards and Standard Development. We have participated in international surveys in order to collect data, which in turn have served as the basis to set up actions. Uh, from our side, we have also collected some internal data about our staff. For example, 58% uh, are women and uh, leading roles is about 53% uh, women. Uh, we have included also the gender issue in our code of ethics. Um, and in uh, 2016, we elaborated an equality plan valid until 2019. But this was uh, made in conjunction with uh, AINOR, uh, from which certification part from which we split in 2017 and this plan included um, uh, measures about access employment professional classification promotion language or remuneration policy but the thing is that we kind of stop it uh, and uh, it was discontinued and now uh, with some delay the new equality commission is uh, right now working on our own equality plan, which will be ready on the first quarter of 2020, uh, 2022, so next year, early next year. Uh, and we have a duration of four years and we are finalizing now, uh, we have identified priorities and actions and indicators and we are finalizing resources and the implementation calendar. So next please. So here is the full panorama of our actions. We are starting, this is true, but we are committed and we are working step by step, both at internal level and with our uh, stakeholders to uh, really have this uh, gender lens in what we are and what we do. Uh, next, please. And I just want to uh, finalize uh, with uh, the save the date for this webinar on 9th. Uh, December, where you are all invited to participate, and if you need more information, I will be happy uh, to provide it to you. Uh, so, next, please. A big thank you for listening, and um, hope to see you on 9th uh, December. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. That a very, very interesting uh, body of work that you've, you're undertaking there, and great plans and great structure, like for for gender responsiveness and gender equality. And been built in there. I see. I see some some uh, friends of gender responsive standardization on the agenda for for uh, 9th of December. We see some friendly faces there. I see Stephanie was was appearing on time as well. So thanks very much, Natalia. I, we can just we're trying to keep on schedule. So if you have questions for Natalia or for Sarah or for for the project team leaders, um, uh, we can hold off just until after um, or, or
Volcana's uh, presentation. So I want to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker and, and uh, see your slides are keep, uh, uh, slides are keep, keyed up already. It's uh, Okana uh, uh, Forkutsa as project manager uh, for standards for Fair Trade International. So um, over to you, Okana. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this introduction. Yes, I'm Oksana Farkutsa from Fairtrade International and uh, representing today here the standards team. I, yeah, um, thank you very much for uh, giving this opportunity. And uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So before we go into details of the standard, uh, a bit of the technical side of the standard, I would like to make sure we're all on the same page and the introduction is the first slide where I would like to highlight that from the perspective of the fair trade system, standards uh, is one of the tools that exists in the system and therefore implementation of the standard uh, follows the mechanism uh, where assurance as a tool uh, is is also considered with auditing and certification, but also the field support and programs that is usually uh, provided and coordinated through producer networks that are based in producer regions. So, for example, therefore, fair trades key approach for gender mainstreaming to affect uh, systemic change is through formalized uh, system of standards, certification body, and a network of the field staff that is uh, producer network organizations. Then through producer network, uh, fair trade supports the organizations by providing trainings, identifying the some gaps of uh, or the triggers of non-compliance and uh, the ways suggesting the ways how to mediate and implement implement social uh, policies. So next slide, please. So how does a uh, fair trade standard address gender equality? Um, basically, the standards are, are we have genetic standards and product specific standards. They have different elements that are maybe product specific or applicable to all regions. But overall, standards are specific about gender positive intervention that need to accommodate the needs of the women at different life stages, but also for companies, organizations uh, to not engage or support or tolerate behavior that is based on gender related violence or such as sexual harassment or other um, other practices. So uh, let's go one by one then. First of all, so basically we have requirements on no discrimination on the basis of gender or marital status. The next one is um, the standard stipulates on uh, for companies, organizations to um, not to have any practices. So basically, zero tolerance of behavior that is sexual, intimidating, abusive, or exploitative. Then um, no testing for pregnancy when recruiting workers. Next. You can just display them all, I guess. Then also uh, organizations or companies have to uh, have um, opportunities for workers to develop their skills. Therefore, organizations need to engage with producer networks or whichever way they prefer, but they need to uh, have programs to support disadvantaged and minority groups and in, uh, in such as women or other. And all organizations need to have gender policy in place that promotes also quali promotes qualified women into leadership and supervision. And uh, in through the standards, we are ensuring that uh, there is a fair gender representation in different fair trade committees. We have premium committee, we have health and safety committee and other committees a little bit on that we'll be talking in the next slide and the last but not least <laughs> uh, we uh, through the standard uh, organizations need to have a grievance procedures in place and um, basically companies need to make sure that this system allows uh, workers to air any grievances and uh, uh, when it comes to sexual harassment uh, the the, the this 
the system is designated to specifically appoint a women or women's committees linked to a female uh, senior manager. So basically, we are trying to set some kind of framework within which certain requirements are must to comply with at the entrance of the fair trade certification, and some others are um, to allow some time for organizations to build their capacity and improve over time. So in the next slide, I'm going through some elements that we have recently upgraded or introduced in the Fair Trade Standard 4T for hired labor organizations. And uh, just to reiterate, the, the standards is following the step-by-step -step approach. And therefore, first, I would like to talk about some key elements that are related to the gender issues that have been introduced. Please, next. Yeah, on labor conditions. Um, so the companies need to comply with the uh, uh, requirements by having a policies in place, a pr procedures in place that help to identify and prevent uh, gender-based violence or forced labor, and also monitor and uh, remediate and be able to remediate to address the issue in case it has been identified in the, uh, in the company. In addition, uh, of course, all companies and organizations need to abide by the applicable laws and national legislations. And uh, further to that, a gender policy is um, the scope of the gender policy covers all kinds of workers and management. So it's basically management, temporary, seasonal or permanent workers and uh, including subcontractors and job brokers. So basically the scope of the gender policy is quite broad and the idea is to ensure that um, that 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 uh, the gender issues are properly addressed and uh, in in when it comes to different groups, of the workers and different committees on the place. So therefore, we also promote or recommend that the policies could be linked on the broader scope, or it here we allow some flexibility and uh, based on the capacity of the companies or organizations, how they can arrange their work and procedures in terms of the implementation of the activities that they outline in these policies. So the next two sections, uh, I'm talking about how on this topic, we are also addressing the worker participation in fair trade certification. It is important because uh, basically the key uh, focus of the hired labor standards is a worker for fair trade and therefore through improving worker participation in fair trade. We are basically hoping to, to for this whole process to be more harmonized uh, on uh, building the capacity and implementing the uh, key elements outlined in the standards. Therefore, women and including young people, they need to be involved in the implementation and review of the gender policy, for example, and um, also the compliance committee Oh, sorry, I just thought that I have only two minutes. Um, okay, so maybe then let's move to the next one because these two elements are interlinked. So basically worker participation in fair trade through building their capacities in the trainings are interlinked and is ongoing process. And what we ensure through the standard is that having the policy in place and procedures in place is a core and is a must for organizations. And this needs to be supported and followed up with other activities like training, capacity building, and enhancing worker participation in the fair trade with the support from fair trade producer organizations based in the regions. So um, one last point here I would like to mention that uh, we have just recently published um, a gender study that is, I will share the link here in the chat, but I wouldn't go, I wouldn't be the best person to talk about the key elements of that study. So I would like to welcome those who are interested to explore and come back to me or um, yeah, I will then bring you in contact with a relevant person. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Oksana. Sorry about the, the, the wrap up quickly there, uh, because, but we have just fabulous talks, really interesting. And we're just going to hold off on the questions for Sarah, Natalia and Oksana until after uh, Lance's um, uh, wrap up. So just want to introduce our acting secretary for WP6, uh, Lance Thompson. Um, so Lance can take take the floor uh, for his uh, GRSI and formalization update. Over to you, Lance. Thanks very much, Ray, and I'll try to be very brief. That way we can uh, catch up on some of the time. Uh, just a reminder that this afternoon, tomorrow, and uh, or later today, rather, uh, tomorrow and uh, Friday, we'll have the uh, annual session of Working Party 6, which is the parent body under which the GRSI uh, operates. Uh, and so we'll have a lot of different uh, discussions on this and an update also from GRSI uh, during the annual session. And one of the things that will be discussed is uh, the future evolution of the GRSI, because you're a very dynamic group and uh, you have quite a lot of very interesting and important work going on. Uh, it would merit uh, that this become uh, an official subgroup of uh, the Working Party 6, uh, so a team of specialists or advisory group, in order to uh, have a, a, an official structure uh, within the UN system. And so uh, during the meeting, it will be uh, suggested that uh, this be transformed into a term, team of specialists, uh, because normally an initiative is only under uh, an advisory group or, or team of specialists. So the education initiative, for example, is under the START uh, ad hoc team of specialists, uh, or there's also pipeline or earth moving machinery, which is also under the START, uh, but GRSI wouldn't really fit under START. So that's why it's proposed that it become uh, an independent new team of specialists uh, under uh, WP6. And this would entail that um, the, uh, we would request the authorization. So not an, a formal approval, but just that there's no objections during the meeting. Uh, it'll be uh, Thursday morning. Uh, no objections that uh, this move forward to become a team of specialists. If there are no objections, then we'll present a terms of reference to the group, obviously, and then also to the steering committee on trade capacity and standardization, which is the parent body of WP6, so multiple levels. <laughs> and then uh, uh, that term of reference could be presented to the, uh, the steering committee for approval. And if it's approved at the steering committee by the member states uh, of, uh, uh, of the steering committee, then it can move forward to the executive committee of UNEC, which is the highest level, which would uh, validate or or not the uh, the request to become a formal team of specialists. So uh, this would mean that there'd be some slight modifications in the organization as you have it today. The project teams, uh, three project teams as it is, are excellent, and that could continue under a team of specialists. Uh, an initiative normally does not have a chair; it has a coordinator. So uh, Stephanie could actually become an official chair of a, of a team of specialists. Uh, and then there would have to be at least one annual meeting. So obviously you're doing that today, but that annual meeting will have to report to the parent body of WP6, which means that it will have to be done uh, at least four months prior to the annual session so that we can finalize the report and present it as a document to the uh, annual session. So it would mean that your next annual big session would not be in November, but it would be more likely be around July, uh, so that we'd be able to have a formal report that we could write up, and then that would be uh, the update that would go into WP6. So um, not a huge change, just a, a small change in timing of meetings, uh, officializing chairmanship, and, uh, and then officializing the group uh, as, a, as a clear sub, uh, subgroup. And that would enable uh, further work to continue and uh, to be recognized in the UNECE and UN system. I, I hope that's clear. I don't know if Ray, you wanted any further information on technical or administrative points, but I'm happy to respond if you do. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Lance. Uh, not from my perspective, I've got this information before. Um, we can, if anybody has any questions for Lance, um, now we're getting to an, an open floor uh, part of the meeting. Um, so, for uh, there's also uh, the SMIIC actually wishes to make a brief update. So, uh, SMIIC, over to you.
who who is uh, speaking on behalf of SMIIC or she? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to give a brief overview of our uh, future plans. Uh, before uh, explaining our uh, initiatives and future plans regarding gender equality, let me give a brief introduction about our institute. A Standards and Metrology Institute for Islamic Countries is an intergovernmental organization which is affiliated to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and it was established on two, uh, 2010. Its headquarters are located in Istanbul. It's made with its 46 member states from different continents, works in the fields of standardization, metrology and accreditation as the essential elements of the quality infrastructure. Developing standards according to the needs of its members and the industry is the main task of SMIC and is, as in other regional and in international standards, we have technical committees established in specific topics and the, the works are conducted by experts from the members and the stakeholders. And last year, we have prepared our new roadmap for the upcoming 10 years, SMIC Strategic Plan 2021-2030, in which we have tried to address the gender issue by setting a specific KPI, which is to increase the percentage of women experts involved in standards projects. This is was taken as the first step to attain the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 5, and in order to ensure gender balance in technical committee works by increasing women presentation in technical committees as well as any standards to be gender responsive regardless of the number of women participations. The baseline for this KPI was measured for the five years, uh, the last five years, which is the previous action plan period, and the percentage was found to be 31%. We wish to increase this percentage 10% gradually by the end of our uh, uh, new uh, strategic plan. By setting this target, we wish to benefit from the capabilities and experiences, qualifications of women experts who may be deprived from opportunities to participate due to gender inequality. And we aim to encourage our member states to empower women and increase their involvement in technical work and in standards development activities. Through the Women, the women Empowerment Program and Initiative, we will launch soon. In this context, we would like to conduct trainings specifically tailored for women experts in which we believe women experts in our members and stakeholders will be encouraged to find opportunity to contribute and to be active in technical development of standards works. Furthermore, we will publish women experts stories in social media by using short videos with a catchy hashtag to raise awareness and to encourage more women to, to share their experience and to let our member states uh, encourage their uh, women to uh, uh, participate in technical committee works. Finally, as a signatory of, of the United Nations Economic Commission uh, Declaration on gender, uh, uh, gender Responsive Standards, we are preparing an action plan so, the, so that we can probably and systematically focus on this issue and set our targets and track our progress we believe that we will reap the benefits of this valuable efforts all together. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for SMIIC. Um, I don't see any other updates, uh, invitations to uh, updates um, from Oshin in the chat, but I do, do see two hands raised, so we'll uh, call those in turn. So the first one I see is Sophie Schwamberger. Sophie, the uh, floor is yours. You're on mute, Sophie. Okay, maybe that's uh, maybe that's a raised hand for some other reason. There's a second raised hand for UNOG SHPH332. 
unidentified speaker. Uh, it's Lance uh, from the Secretariat, ah. so the acting chair. Sorry, I, I've reserved the room so you can see me alone in my room. But uh, uh, just a small statement from the START ED initiative. So this is the initiative on education on standardization within uh, WP6, which is like a sister initiative. And um, Sergey Kuzmin is based on the west coast of Canada. So this is very early for him. And so he asked if I would make a, a short statement from the START ED. He wanted to inform the GRSI that uh, the Declaration on Gender Responsive Standards was reported to the EASC, so the Eurasian Council for Standardization, Metrology and uh, Certification. Uh, this was done in May uh, earlier this year. And uh, the START ED group also has been working on a set of modules. So there are 12 modules on education on standardization. And they're very eager and interested in eventually adding an additional module on uh, gender issues and gender inclusive, st gender responsive standards and gender inclusive uh, standards development. And they're ready to work on this on this issue uh, with the help of the GRSI uh, experts. Uh, and that is it from Sergey from the START ED initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance, uh, for that update from started. Uh, we do have one question in the in the chat, uh, which came in from uh, uh, Gopi on behalf of uh, Sandhya uh, Boga from Mauritius, and the question is for Sarah for Sarah Gobi, and and the question was um, I had it highlighted here in the chat. I said more chat has come in and it's it's moved up. Is ASTM offering build capacity building for women in the field of three D printing? And uh, that's because the uh, the question has been asked by someone who's interested in the field. So, uh, yes, if you have, uh, um, thank you. Sarah? This is Sarah. Thank you for the question. And uh, um, I've already I, I saw that in the chat, and so I've already forwarded the question to my colleagues of the three D printing department. And I'm sure we are uh, offering capacity building and and and, and other training and we will be in touch. I don't know what's the best way to provide um, a feedback, um, uh, but I also wanted to add that we have, ASTM has a memorandum of understanding agreement with the, with the standard uh, body of Mauritius. And, and so that might be a way for us to directly communicate with them um, and offer our services in this space. Otherwise, I can share my my feedback to this group with this group um, in the coming days, and then um, yeah, it will be hopefully distributed to the person uh, who asked the question. Okay, and that was for the standards body of Mauritius. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sarah. Is there any other questions? We should check see if any hands raised. Um, I don't see any. In the chat, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so, uh, and unless Lance, do you have you any final closing words that you want to finish up with? Uh, thanks, Ray. No, just an open invitation to everyone later today to join the annual session of WP six, and then the sessions we'll have tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Uh, Geneva time will have the GRSI presentation. And then presentation from other organizations related to regulatory cooperation and standardization policy. And then tomorrow afternoon, Geneva time, we'll have a panel on uh, circular, econo circular economy. And there'll be multiple presentations about the work of WP6 and how this relates back to, uh, to circular economy. And Stephanie uh, will have a, an intervention there to explain uh, why it's important, uh, gender responsiveness and gender inclusiveness. Uh, when moving towards uh, a circular economy, very interesting presentation, and then an open discussion Friday morning to discuss how what we would have seen on Thursday afternoon uh, can be implemented into WP6 and into the future work plan. So I think there's a lot of interesting things coming up uh, in the annual session. I think that there's been a lot of excellent work in uh, the GRSI uh, over the past period, uh, very much looking forward to the publication that will be coming out later on, the, uh, uh, the questionnaire, which will be made available very shortly, and, uh, and then the um, glossary 
uh, which will also be worked on, I believe, uh, on gender inclusive terms. So uh, thank you very much uh, from the Secretariat side uh, for all of the hard work that all of you have been doing and the engagement that you have within WP6 and the UN system. I, I'm not sure if Oishin had any final remarks uh, as he's been uh, really leading and following all of the work uh, from the Secretariat side. But thank you from the Secretary of WP6. Thanks very much, Lance. Thanks, to, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Oshin, have you anything that you'd like to add? No, nothing on my side. Uh, only to address uh, Deborah's question. We don't have a precise date, though we're looking at early February of 2022 for the next meeting of the GRSI. Okay. Thank you very much, Oshin. And uh, so thanks to Lance and, and Oshin and to Towner and all the experts from UNECE who make make this um these sessions happened uh, so seamlessly. Thanks to our real chair, Stephanie Einan. Uh, thanks to Sally Swinjud, to Louise Hosking, to Lorelai Carbalanati, to Caria Samuels, uh, to Lucy Hay, to Michelle Parcuda, to Sarah Gobby, to Natalia Ortiz de Zarata, to Oksana Pokutsa, to uh, and to uh, all of the team um, who made this uh, this session uh, uh, possible. Uh, thanks very much from from us and uh, hope to see you all soon take care and god bless goodbye bye thank you so much